Hi, everybody. My name is Philip Gilpin, Jr., and I am the executive director of Catalyst. I'm here today with a very special guest, Mr. A.J. Tesler, who is the original founder and creator of Catalyst, formerly known as ITV Fest. Uh, so, A.J., if you just want to say hello to everybody and introduce yourself about, you know, where you're from and, and how'd you get involved in this crazy industry? Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, having me do this. I'm excited to share the story and talk about uh, ITV Fest, Catalyst, and how it all came to be. It's uh, I'm originally from Stanford, Connecticut. I went to school in Chicago. I lived in New York for a little bit, found myself in Los Angeles as an actor and desperate for anything to do in my free time. Um, so a lot of my friends were just writing, and we happened to have a nice camera, so we were also shooting. And We just kind of started making television pilots because it was easier to do than um, than features. And it didn't require as much uh, specific artistry as like a short film would. So, and I don't know. I think that it it was we all wanted to work in TV, so it made sense to start making television pilots. And once we did that, we realized that we still didn't really know how to get in the hands of agents or or producers or reps who might be able to help. And so I thought that we. Sh- can't possibly be the only people making independent television pilots with the hopes of, of, of breaking into the television industry. So I thought that it would make sense to just invite everybody who had done that into to Los Angeles, where we started this festival and, and screen a bunch of these television pilots for industry executives uh, in hopes that we can make those connections and make those introductions to help people establish television careers where previously they were just on the kind of independent track. Um, and so in 2005, I sent out an email to 450 people that I knew and said, Hey, I am launching this thing. I think it's a good idea. And, um, if you know anybody who's made a television pilot or is interested in the space, I'd love to connect with them. And by the time the first festival rolled around about 10 months later, uh, it was sponsored by Comcast and it was, uh, There were over a thousand people at our opening night party, the second year party. Biz Marquee ended up being the DJ and it became a a pretty exciting independent event. And the people that we got to meet through that and the people that we got to to showcase their stuff, it ranges from all kinds of people you may recognize from TV and film today to to people who have moved on to other industries and and found success there and moved on in, in behind other behind the scenes things. So, you know, it, it really has been an incredible journey to see the festival continue to truck on, continue to provide opportunities for, for, for budding filmmakers and, uh, and continue to make those introductions to people that, uh, that allow people to continue to make the things they want to make and tell the stories they want to tell. Yeah. So when you mentioned that you started, uh, I was some friends just running around using a camera. Was that pre-digital days or was that right at the advent of the, the digital film technology? Were you still doing these on film stock? I mean, how old do you think I am? They were not talkies. <laughs> uh, it was mostly just still frames that we would tape together. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was digital. Everything was digital. We, but we were shooting on like our nice camera at the time was a DVX 100. You know? it, it, it was on mini DV tape or HDV tape. The HDVs were the good ones, you know, uh, they never worked right in any machine. Like you only could get this one particular thing. Um, but man, did that stuff look like something that wasn't a VHS recorder, which yeah. is kind of, I grew up making, making things on. And yeah. so it's just, uh, uh, and the year before we launched the festival or I launched in 2005 and YouTube hadn't even made their big announcement, hadn't even really launched. They launched right before the first festival. And so that's, that's kind of places us right at the beginning of the whole digital content explosion um, and why we started focusing on web series so early. And now Catalyst is the longest consecutive running television, independent television festival in the world, which is a pretty incredible thing to say. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you talk about starting making VHS tapes. Why did you want to get into production in the first place? What attracted you to the storytelling industry? It's just as a, as a human. Um, I mean, first of all, there's no proof that I'm a human, but I I'm making that mistake. Was that? I keep making that mistake. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, 
I think that for me, it was always about entertaining. It was always about making people laugh and, and, and finding a way to, to, to make people enjoy whatever moment they were in. Um, and so it started out for me as, as acting and performing. And when I realized that I wasn't going to have as much control over my career and my life as I would have liked in that industry, in that business, um, I started pivoting to, to producing and to, to directing. And so, um, and a lot of producing for me is just puzzle solving and bringing people together, which is really the thing that I've always been good at. So it became a, uh, I became the guy for all of my friends who was willing to be the producer <laughs> because when you're a performer and you're starting, you're starting out or you're a writer, it's, it's a very individualistic path. And to find somebody else who's like, I can help you do this uh, is was when I was performing was like, really, you're going to help me. This is, this is amazing. And so I just became that guy for my friends, knowing that that's what I wanted as a performer and as a writer. Um, and so and as all of us started getting more and more professional opportunities, I just got to be the guy that helped everybody make their thing. Um, and so it, it allowed me to make stuff for Sony and Fox TV studios and television pilots for MTV. And I was line producing for Kevin Pollack. You know, it was kind of, I ran the gambit of all of these different opportunities because I made myself available for those things. And you got to know people you know, grow those relationships over the years and keep those as they grow. Yeah. I, uh, uh, when you show up in wherever, whatever city you are, every, your entire career is going to be based on your network. It's going to be based on who your relationships are. And there are people who, uh, take that too seriously and, and isolate their friends because they're really after a network. And those people are who they are. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, if you continue to support each other and continue to support your friends and continue to be a part of a group, it all feels like a, a graduate class of people who continue to get opportunities. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really what it became for me, too, is just like my the class that I showed up to Los Angeles with and the relationships that I built there at whatever thing that you go to when you're 25 and you're too tired to go to when you're 45. Um, <laughs> that's uh, that's who ends up being people who are supporting you in whatever you end up doing and vice versa. So, you know, I can call a lot of those people from those early days to come and be a part of a project of mine based on the relationship that I built 15, 16 years ago. Mm -hmm. And are most of those relationships, what you're leaning on professionally now with the work you're doing, tell us a little bit about your career trajectory and, you know, what you were working on back then and what you're doing now. So, uh, I've been able to really bridge the gap between uh, creative producing and physical production for most of my career, because when I was dealing with a lot of the web budgets in the early days, there wasn't really money for both those people. And because all I really cared about was making the best thing I possibly could, um, there wasn't really a conflict of interest because I was going to spend every dollar I could as wisely as I could so that I could make the best thing I possibly could so that the next thing could be even better. And for me, it's always been about what's the next thing I'm going to get to make if I do this thing. Um, so I started out on the production side and doing produ producing all the way through. Um, and through that, I had a bunch of interesting creative opportunities. I, I I've been able to run a couple of digital shows and been able to you know, be the creative lead on a lot of stuff, have been... I've worked with a ton of my favorite celebrities throughout the years, people I've looked up to from the early days of my never really existent stand-up career. And, um, and, and so through all that, through all those relationships, I've ended up actually getting a chance to direct a, a narrative feature length film called Mayfield's game, which pending the coronavirus, will be out someday. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just, it, it really is, it's based on maintaining relationships and, uh, and continuing, continuing to make yourself available. And that's, that's kind of at least how, how my career has developed. And it, it's different for every person. You know, some people get incredible opportunities on day one and some people, uh, it takes a little bit longer and it, it's longevity, it's tenacity, and it's just being good at your job. And if you can kind of manage all those things, then, then you should be okay. You mentioned in there a real interesting phrase, which is the difference between creative producing and 
physical production. Uh, today, you know, a lot of creators are kind of doing everything on their own. Uh, but talk a little bit about what you mean about bridging that gap between uh, creative producing versus physical production and, and the, the different career paths that those can uh, lead people down. Um, I think that in, in Hollywood, you get pigeonholed really quickly and really easily. And if you get good at something, then that's the thing you want to do. And I, I use the example of somebody like Al Pacino, who got really good at yelling on camera. And so all of his later movies are basically, he's become a caricature of himself. And I think that that's true of most actors that you can think of. Is they nailed one role and then that just became the thing that they were asked to repeat over and over again. Because ultimately, the entire business is based on who can I trust with my money. Mm-hmm. And when I'm looking for somebody that I can trust with my money, I want to make sure that they have done the exact same thing that I'm looking for and have been extremely successful in it. Because that gives me at least the most amount of assurances that I could possibly get in this business that what I'm paying for, I'm going to get what I expect. Mm. Um, and so in terms of career paths, the the idea of like, if you get into physical production, you can ultimately make the, ju- the jump to creative production. It's really not that easy. And you know, for me, I've been a line producer, I've been a creative producer, I've been a director. I, I don't think that that's that standard. I think that um, it just so happened that I had enough kind of experience in each thing. I'd done enough directing. I'd done enough things on the smaller scale that somebody was like, okay, I can trust you to do this. Um, but for the most part, you know, once you go after the thing that you want and, and make that the path. And then to be honest, if you get to the, that path and you realize it's not what you want, then you can start thinking about how do I change it? You're never stuck in Hollywood because the people that you know and the relationships you build at whatever stop it is, those are the tender that those are, that's the currency that you have to deal with. So, you know, for me, I had run production for one of the large comedy networks online. And so as a result of that, I was able to parlay a lot of the relationships that I had into this into this movie and into a couple of the movies that I've had a chance to make because uh, because they know that if they hire me, that it comes with a chance that they're going to be able to capitalize on some of the relationships that I've built over the course of my career. Right, because you, you, um, you, you have friends on both sides. I do have friends on both sides. I know, you know, I can, because I, because I've been doing physical production for the web and for TV and for all these different things for so long that it really is. I have, I know who the person is that I can call for almost everything. Now I've never done a blockbuster. So when I see uh, Skyfall, my first thought is, well, I don't know who the guy is that I call to get an abandoned Island filled with real looking <laughs> buildings. Like that's just not, that's not in my Rolodex, but yeah. somebody who can nail a green screen shoot at a, in, in a three by three box like that, I can get no problem. I got that done. Yeah. So um, uh, bridging the gap is not the easiest thing, but, and, you know, since on some level, if you're good, if you're adding the physical production and you want to jump to creative producing, it's just about making it yourself. It's about using the resources you have and the relationships you've built in order to make the best thing you can on the creative side. So you can prove yourself as a creative producer. Uh, but creative producing is about creating and not just about being the guy who says, yeah, good job, yeah. Um, which I think on some level is what a lot of us really hope for. It's just the job that you you show up, you tell people if you think it's good, and then you leave and you get paid a lot of money. And that job doesn't really exist. There are non-writing EPs, but those people have been heavily involved in the development of a project with a writer, with a package that becomes something on, on a major network. And that's the only way that those people get trusted to actually be creative themselves is by attaching themselves to another creative that the network already believes in. Yeah. So you, you talk about, you know, creating things and it sounds like that's the point and the purpose of, of why you enjoy doing all this. Let's, let's jump back to the really early beginning days of you and Jenny and whoever else was there with you at the beginning. Talk about where, you know, the idea for the, for the organization came from uh, and what those first really few years were like where people probably kept saying to you, you're, what are you doing? What is this? What's going on? Um, well, my guess is that they're still saying the same thing to you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, 
You know, it was, it was so much about what we were doing was because we didn't know how to get in touch with people and we didn't know how to, how to further our own careers. And we thought that other people were in the same boat and we wanted to provide a platform and opportunity for, to do that. And so those first couple of years uh, was really about just taking whatever we could to make sure that that's what we were doing. So every sponsor, if they were going to sponsor without money, they were going to provide a prize that was going to help a new filmmaker um, get to the next level of their career. If they were going to provide distribution, it was going to be on the creator's terms. Uh, and there was going to be some kind of prize that goes along with it. You know, it's very much like about making sure that people who are making things out of their own pocket for the only, the only reason you'd be making something for a festival like this is for the hopes that it gets noticed and purchased or developed or get you an agent. Because, you know, even 15 years in, the market for independently produced television pilots is razor thin. Um, you know, there are certainly a lot more examples today than there were when we started about people who make their own shows and then they get picked up, redeveloped and turned into something. Um, in our first year, we had It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia gave a panel, showed the original pilot they made before it became Guys in Philly in a Bar. And it was an incredible experience to really see like, oh, this is a thing that can actually happen. Um, you know, and I, I think that being, um, so what challenges did we encounter? I mean, it was a lot of education. It was education for creators knew exactly what we were doing right, right from the, right from the get, you know, uh, people would, people jumped in and, and, and had, were making stuff specifically for us right after year one. Uh, it was, it was in the industry too, you know, we started in Los Angeles. So the Ted Sarandos of the world weren't showing up, but the JRHTS and the assistants and the, uh, the manager level people, and even the director level people, to some extent, we're all getting involved. The director levels were a lot of our, uh, a lot of our judges and some executive producer level type people as well and some just creative executives at various stages of their careers would get involved as well mm -hmm. um, but uh but getting the top level executive involved uh was always tricky and i think that it will always continue to be you know i don't i, I don't know if ted sarando shows up at at sundance either um and i can't imagine reed hastings does mm -hmm. you know these guys are too busy doing everything else in the world so uh so they send their their minions to, to to report back on what makes sense for whatever platform it is um and you know i think that that's that's just the way all of these things all of these things go now continuing to attract the kind of people that can help people's careers uh as the festival jumps around um my guess is that will continue to be a challenge but you know i kudos to you on really sticking with that entire idea of of really finding ways to make sure that the creators have the opportunities that merit them continuing to make things and continuing to do this and, and continuing to submit to the festival thanks yeah yeah i mean you know you know it's, that's not easy it wasn't then and and it's interesting how over the last 15 years as streaming and digital has come along you would almost think that instinctually it would make sense that more opportunities would pop up and indie you know, pilots would, and series would become eat more easily bought and distributed. But like you said, it's still it's still a pretty narrow world. And so I want to ask, you know, kind of the obvious question, which is you've been on both the film and the and the TV side. You know, what do you see that the major differences are between the production and economic models of making a film versus making a TV series that kind of keep this this box, uh, you know, uh, pretty small right now when it comes to even though there's YouTube TV and Pluto and and all these apps and Crackle and all these things, um, what do, what do you think the reason is? Is that there is, hasn't been this massive explosion for independent episodics? Well, I mean, I think that it's the repeat the repeatability of it is that if you're making an indie film and you're keeping your costs low, then license deals are available for people who have low cost movies that are available to fill libraries. There's a lot of people looking for library content that they can't spend millions of dollars on, but they can spend tens of thousands and in some cases, hundreds of thousands of dollars on 
so that you can make your money back if you've been smart about what your indie film budget is. When you start getting into the indie TV world, now if you've kept your costs low, then the chances are that your project doesn't necessarily look TV ready. And look, I am as big a proponent of cutting every corner as you can when when your dollars are low. But if what you're showing to something somebody is is competing with the other professionally made television pilots that they've seen that year, you have to be competitive in how it looks and how it feels and how the story was developed. There can't be any mistakes. And I talked about this at the uh, festival in, Man- in Manchester too. Like it, it, it really has to be the best version, not that you can make, but the best version of your show in order for you to have a, ch- have a chance. Um, and I think with indie film, it's a one-off. So whatever I'm investing in it is limited versus if I'm going to pay for a series of your television show, that's a, that's a much bigger dollar amount that I now have to fund in order. And it goes back to the trust thing of in order to trust a new creator who can deliver at the same incredible quality as this show was for the length of a 10, 13, 26 episode, 52, 100 episode series. Mm-hmm. And I think that the, the learning curve for somebody to put their own job on the line for somebody who is making their first thing, no matter how good, interesting it is, it's just a tough nut to swallow on the indie TV side. Mm-hmm. The indie film side, again, it's, it's, it's one check for one project. And if you get the right talent, you have a good sense that you're going to be able to make your money back. But with TV, the whole market is different because you're not selling your series. You've got your pilot is your pitch. And if your pitch is excellent, a hundred percent a plus, then you have a chance, but you have a chance of it going straight to NBC or ABC or CBS I mean, that's just a that's a very hard road because they have a system in place so that all of the writers that they trust to be showrunners on their own networks are people that they have groomed over the course of many years. If you think about and in terms of baseball, that there's a minor league team and a major league team and the minor league team isn't the indie creators in the TV world. It's the staff writers in the uh, in the broadcast world and in the cable world. And those are the people that as you work up the ranks, you get a chance to actually run your own show. And the same goes with the indie TV world is you're showcasing, if you're showcasing it, you're showcasing as a writer, as a director, as an actor, as a producer, all of these different things. And I think that it's hard for a buyer to really go, okay, this comes with six people. Who was the creator of the show? And how do we really make sure that that creator is supported in a way that can help them get this same execution for what comes next. Um, and you know, I don't think that anybody has, I don't think that, I think that that education is still hard, is still following kind of all of the rest of what you've done with Catalyst and what we were doing with ITV Fest of like educating people that, A, educating the, the executives that, that the, the talent is out there, that they may require a little extra handholding, but the networks do that all the time and partner new creative voices with top end showrunners so that they're still protected. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that there's been some hesitation to do that because there is still this entire minor league system of people that have a little bit more cachet that allows them to actually. Uh, and hedge their bets a little bit more than than what the risk factor would be of an indie TV producer. Now, you know, I'm I, I'm making it sound like it, it's there's no reason for you to make your indie show, um, and that's not the intention because the intention is that eventually the indie TV world is the minor leagues, but you also have to be honest with yourself about what your role is. So. The minor leagues for a writer, you know, you can get picked up if you have a hilarious pilot, you can get jobs as a staff writer on a show. 
can you get jobs as a creator of a show? I mean, that's just, that's harder. Mm -hmm. If you have produced or directed an excellent television pilot, are you then going to go and produce and direct your own uh, broadcast television show? That's going to be harder. But are you going to get an opportunity or is it possible that you get those same opportunities to make the Comedy Central web series version of your show? Or the, uh, you know, what is that ne that D level? And I don't mean D level like celebrity D level. I mean D level like developmental league in basketball. Um, what, you know, there's there are steps to it all. And I think that making your show is an excellent first step. But your second step isn't the championship. Your second step is still that next phase of your career. And you still have to think of it as a ladder and you still have to think about it as a uh, as developing a career instead of winning a lottery. Well, talk about some of those some of those ladders that you've seen happen over the last you know fifteen years, specifically coming through the early days with you. And uh, who are some of the people? What are some of the shows that you've seen take some steps forward that came out of the work from you know from what you you pioneered? Yeah, you know, th there's there's really a lot of examples of people who've gotten success from the festival too, and and success in the ways that I'm talking about. You know. You won't have heard of a lot of the shows that have then made it directly to air from that. But like Jake, Jake Johnson, uh, who later became a major star on The New Girl, and Eric Edelstein, they won the comedy division of our first ever festival. Um, and from that, NBC was interested in them and their show. They got packaged with agents and managers as a result of it all. Um, we've seen people like the Knee Brothers come through the festival. Similar story. Comedy Central was very interested in what they were doing. There's there was a pilot called The Geniuses that got picked up by Comedy Central. It there every year. There's four, five, six different stories like that. Of you know, even me, like I, my career and and what I've been able to accomplish is based on the relationships that I built at the festival. Um, you know, the first movie that I did was. Uh, was a coworker uh, recommended me for the job. That person was a coworker from my first job after ITV Fest that I got hired on, based on my relationship that I built at ITV Fest. Yeah. So um, you know, it. I think that, uh, and and there are writers and 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 actors and all kinds of people. There's there's examples all over the place of people who've made relationships, made other shows. Together, there have been people who have gotten into pitch rooms and gotten into to meetings they never would have. And, and you know, it, it, just like Hollywood is about building relationships, that's what the festival is as well: is building those relationships so that your next project with that person might be able to elevate whatever your last thing was. So, so why do you think there are only two independent television festivals? Um. I mean, I think that the reason there are only two independent television festivals is is because of what the marketplace is. Is because uh, you know there there are documentary film festivals that get thousands of submissions because there are thousands of people making documentaries because the the price of admission is low and the chance for success is high. Mm -hmm. And I think that making your own independently produced television pilot is risky, takes a certain kind of person with a ton of courage and a ton of creative will in order to really dedicate themselves to making one continued story without any thought or hope for how that story continues. Yeah. Um, you know, you're so, so I think that from the creator standpoint, there's not a billion people making television pilots. And then from the industry standpoint, there's, as, as we've talked about, the, the risk factor for the industry is higher than it is if they just kind of stick with the way they've always done things. Right. So that leads me to kind of the, the it, what I call the indie paradox, which I get asked about all the time, which is things like uh, YouTube and streaming and... Right. Uh, what's seen as a general lack of new content. Um, why is it that you think there isn't a indie, I mean, if you have, you have web series uh, that, that go online, right? And mm -hmm. have success. Where do you see the, the difference between these online series 
uh, versus like an indie TV series, if you will. And, and, and why do you think that that has been, uh, you know, that there isn't like an indie TV channel on YouTube or something? Well, because YouTube is an indie TV channel. Right. Um, the entire platform is people who've made their own thing and put it out there and democratized the entire process. And that's fine and good, but to be able to build a channel, a successful channel that allows you to fund your actual highly produced television show is a very difficult climb. It's not impossible. I mean, I've certainly run and supervised production on a number of those kinds of channels that started as nothing, really focused, built their entire network, and now can make 22 episode shows every two weeks and uh, and still make a ton of money on the, on the other side of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but... Uh, the th- and I think that part of the, the mainstream audience doesn't necessarily see YouTube as uh, as premium content yeah. it's because it lacks that gatekeeper aspect of it. There's nobody in between the audience and the creator. And that works really well for YouTube and it works really well for creators because people have the opportunity to talk directly to their audience and really communicate with their audience, which is unlike anything you can experience on TV or even Facebook, you know, any of these other platforms. It's not really like that in the same way that it is on YouTube. Um, It's interesting you mentioned about the lack of gatekeeper because we find that a lot in talking with general audiences about, you know, why why should they go? Why should they care about watching these shows they haven't heard of or creators that they don't necessarily know? And there is something in the cachet of having that gatekeeper say, no, it lives behind my paywall as opposed to just, you know, artist directly to consumer. That is an interesting... Uh, psychological aspect of it. Yeah, and I mean, I think that that's why the festival is valuable too, is because yeah. it's the only gatekeeper for indie TV. Most people just put up their thing on online, and if they get an audience, then that's how people are going to find them, and that's how that's how they're going to be able to make the next version of their show. But the fact of the matter is that that's just a lottery ticket. Like you just never really know what people are going to respond to, how they're going to respond, and if you're going to get a size enough audience to attract them and once you put it up then it's over and you don't have any other real distribution or, or options especially if you put it up and it doesn't have an audience and uh, you're trying to sell it as something that's going to be a hit yeah. so you know it, I think that gatekeepers like catalysts are important because it does give the industry a uh, a signal that somebody that they trust has watched this um, has signed off on it being promising, and that these people are people that are people to look out for. And after, oh, about, what was it, seven years or so of you being the gatekeeper there when starting the festival and running the organization in L.A., you had a a pretty major life change that caused you to kind of take a different path and, uh, you know, start producing and focusing on family. And uh, I was able to step in and, and attempt to fill the shoes that you and, Jenny and the team had started, but do you want to talk a bit about kind of what happened there and, and why things took a different turn for you and what you're working on now? Sure. So one of the, um, so my daughter was diagnosed with a neurological disorder in 2013. Um, she was born in 2010. So, you know, it was a couple of years of struggling to try to figure out what was going on with her. And the, the disorder is called Rett syndrome. It's a rare neurological disorder, affects mostly girls, sometimes boys. They start to develop typically, and then by the time they turn two, they start to lose the abilities that they've already learned, the ability to use their hands to talk, talk and walk, uh, seizures, so on and so forth. Um, but they have discovered that it's curable in a laboratory. So in 2007, they were able to prove that it's actually reversible. So as soon as I found out about that, I was like, well, this now seems like the most important thing I could possibly focus my energies on it in my entire life. And considering there's about 350,000 people in the world with Rett syndrome, uh, this was a thing that I could really do. Um, and I could start to do what, use the skills that I had in order to help my daughter and all the girls and, and, and people like that. And so, um, so I launched a YouTube channel called Magnolia's Hope and we put up a bunch of PSAs and, and I've used all of the relationships that I've talked to about earlier on in this chat about to, to really try to capitalize on, on as much star power as I can for this rare neurological disorder that most people have never heard of. And um, through all that, I actually created a documentary called Magnolia's Hope. Um, and we are currently in talks with, about distribution, what we're doing with that. Obviously, it's, it's been doing the festival run for the past year. And now we're 
in this Corona times of who knows what any kind of distribution looks like at the end of this. Um, but, uh, we're trying to, trying to come up with some creative ways to, to get the movie out there into the hands of people that it can really help and hope that that has an impact. And really since Maggie was diagnosed, I've really been focused on trying to make sure that the stories that I tell matter and that there's a reason that I'm sharing this particular story. Um, I was very much a guy who would just take the job because the job was available. And I think that I've been able to become a lot more successful. And granted, the early days of those of that career where I was saying yes to everything allowed me the opportunity to have multiple choices later on in my career. So I could choose the one that actually made sense for me. But, um, but it's just become the most important thing is to really make sure that things that I do ha have some impact and there's a reason to be telling this story because if it's going to take me away from my family, then there has to be a really good reason. So you mentioned about career changes. Now, obviously, just in the last couple months with the COVID issue coming up, that's been an entire shift in the industry that we'll, we'll talk about next. But talk about what you've seen as some of the, the major changes and opportunities, the exciting things, the, the bad things, the difficult things that you've seen happen over uh, the course of your career in terms of, you know, you started, you bridging that gap between a pre-digital age and a digital age. Uh, and you've really seen a lot and been involved in a lot from stand up to producing your own things and, and uh, you know, being an executive and being a creative. Uh, what are some of the largest changes that you, you'd, you'd say you've seen over the last 20 years or 30 years you've been doing this? Hmm. You know, I, I, I don't know that it, to me, it seems like the industry is actually fairly slow to change. A lot of the ways they do things. Uh, have not changed significantly in, in the in the 20 years I've been around. And I think that there, the changes that I've seen and the positive changes that I've seen is a focus on including more diverse voices and telling different versions of stories. And I think that that's very exciting and interesting. And especially, you know, looking back at all the movies that I grew up on, never having really... A, an awareness of how how all of these stories were told in a way that really marginalized all of these other groups. Uh, it's 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 exciting to see that there's at least an awareness of that as a as a necessary change. Mm -hmm. Now that said, the uh, industry is still focused on what the audience is, and there's still a lot of the audience that. Uh, that doesn't want any change. So, you know, there's a lot of juggling to make sure that, that that happens. The discovery of talent and how that happens has changed. Obviously YouTube has really democratized the process. I know people who have become major filmmakers and award winners and so on and so forth based on what their YouTube channel started on as, you know, Lily Singh has a late night talk show based on, based on her YouTube personality. Colleen Baldinger was able to be on, the Jerry Seinfeld show, you know, there's the discovery of, of talent has changed a lot. Um, and, and I think that it's going, it's going to continue to change dramatically in the post Corona era because how we produce things is going to have to dramatically change in order to make sure that everybody stays safe. And you know, essentially you have to wrap an actor in a bubble because if an actor goes down and they're a star of a movie or a show, your entire show and movie is over. Yeah, uh, you clearly have an almost Rolodex-like mind of just being, you know, people that you've known and you've gotten to know over the years. And um, as a producer, give give some young starting out producers a tip on how do you manage to keep track? Do you wake up in the morning and read every trade and know everything that's going on? Or is this just people that you know that were news that comes your way through people you talk to? How do you organize and, and get to stay up to date on everything that's going on? Um, I'm just... Uh, you know, I, I don't know that there's a, a particular thing that I do that's different than anybody else or, or a particular process that I have in it specific, certainly not for that specific end to, uh, to keep track of a Rolodex or whatever. I mean, it's, uh, you'll read something, it'll spark something else. You'll, you'll, you'll see a picture, you'll read a script, you'll, somebody will pass on something that will remind you of something you'll you'll get a casting director to send you a list and you're oh i know these three people 
I, I think I did improv with them in 2005. Let me yeah. see if I still have their phone number on my phone. <laughs> and I do. So, um, you know, it's, and I wouldn't say that I'm, uh, I'm a top notch relationship cultivator. You know, it's, I just assume that if I remember somebody that it's, they remember me. And that is my own privilege and confidence that uh, is not always the case. Um, but, uh, but for the most part, uh, there's at least some recognition of the, of the time of the place. And I do have, I do am able to remember people's like where I met them, when the last time I saw them and, uh, and generally what their email address is, which is a weird thing that I do. I do know people's email addresses by their first and last name. So that's, uh, that's just, my, that's a weird, that's a weird. <laughs> <story of mine. laughs> that's suspect because you like to interject, uh, conversations with things that sound plausible but most of the time they're not it's you it's your stand-up moment so i'm not sure if that's true or not that is, that is the one thing that i've learned about myself is that like i'll meet somebody and i'll be and i'll be like oh your email address is um <laughs> uh, well, when uh, the comedy store yeah. opens again that that can be uh that can be a starting seven minutes <laughs> uh, the worst seven minutes of my the second worst seven minutes of my life Trailed only by the actual seven minutes that I did when I was 22. <laughs> Please tell me it's on film somewhere. I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. And I am just glad I'm not running for public office. It's the end of April of 2020. I have to ask you the obligatory question. What's your prediction? How did, where does this industry go? What do we do next? You talk about rapping actors and bubbles. You might not be far off. Uh, I, I mean, look, I, I think that... I, it is our goal, our job as producers to figure out how to make something under whatever circumstances it is. And I think that every producer is going to come up with their own way of doing it in a way that everybody involved feels safe and comfortable. And if they're doing it in a way that they don't feel safe and comfortable, then people don't continue to work for that producer um, in the same way that is true now. But, uh, you know, if you need Tom Cruise to be underwater for three and a half minutes of a movie, you make sure that every single I is dotted and T is crossed so that he is as safe as is humanly possible. Um, and I think the same will be true here. I've already started thinking about all of the various ways that we could make something under these same guidelines of social distancing. Um, I think that everybody's going to have their own process. And I think as long as, and, and that's always been the role of the producer. Here's an impossible task. It's just words on a page. How do we make it? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what it is. That's, that, that's what, that's exactly how we're going to do get, come out on the other side of this. We're going to need to continue to make things. I mean, I think on some level, the sheer breadth of how much content there is has slowed down the anxiety of like how quickly we need to continue to make things. Because it's like, oh, people are like, oh, I can, I can catch up on Netflix a little bit. Yeah. Um, there's not a new show every six hours. Yeah. So, um, so I think that there will be a little bit of time before we get back into production. And once, we, once we're back into production, it'll be the same thing where I need to somebody who I can trust with the money and who I can trust is going to keep everybody safe so that I'm not paying insurance premiums that start doubling and tripling because my entire crew went down and I need to stop production for a week, right. or two weeks. And then I have to pay for all kinds of other problems that, that, that comes out of that. You know, it's... It, I think the the world will continue on. It's we're just going to have to accept that things are going to be different, and um, you know, I, I imagine that every episode of new television next season will have at least one social distancing episode. Um, that that's just the a plot, mm -hmm. and everybody else. Um, and and I can't imagine how many pandemic screenplays have been written over the past 30 days. We're already seeing them. 
Yeah, I mean, look, I wrote I wrote one four years ago and never did anything with it, and now I'm like, oh well. <laughs> Uh, so I, I just think that it's going to be, it, it's going to be different. It's, it, some people will decide that just everybody wears masks. Some people will decide that we'll do it all, all in small groups. There are reality shows that will blow up because you can make, you can make a reality show with three people. Um, the scripted stuff, it's certainly the audience driven multi-cams are going to change pretty dramatically. Uh, single cam, I think it's just in terms of process, but I think that we're all going to figure it out because that's what producers do. So we solve problems and we always have. And, um, and every single script has an impossibility in it someplace, every good one. And now every script does. So, um, it'll, it'll take some time for people to be comfortable, but once once those processes are, are in place, then those are the producers that I think will, will rise to the top and be in heavy demand because all the actors trust that that person has their, in, their best interests at heart. Yeah, storytelling as an industry isn't going anywhere. It's just going to change again. Yeah, I mean, like, why? Well, there'll be more robotic cameras. There'll be, like, look at what they're doing with SNL. Everybody's recording from their own house. You know, there's... Yeah. That you, we'll get we'll get creative. That's what that's what this whole industry is about. Um, some of the things that you're used to seeing will change dramatically forever, and some some of them they're like, there's no reason they can't just build Jimmy's set in his apartment. Yeah, and then it doesn't even look any different. You know, it there's this was caught us by surprise. There's some catch up, but once we're caught up think we're going to be able to tell some very incredible stories and 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 make some incredible things that you wouldn't have thought possible and you'll sit there and watch them as an audience member as i do for everything that i watch and say how did they pull this off yeah. how did they do this giant crowd scene in a time when we're not allowed to do crowd scenes yeah. and i think that figuring that out is something that's actually really interesting like it's Cre finding a solve for problems like that that's 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 what i excites me about producing yeah well you at you you mentioned at the start that you got into this because you enjoy solving problems and and now you got the ultimate one <laughs> or one of the many yeah, yeah. So, um it as we wrap up here is there anything that you want to you want to let creators or, or set you know people who are starting out or even if they're not starting out people who are further on down the road in their careers that you want them to know about you and the organization and why you why you see this as important going forward uh, as the industry does continue to grow and change? Well, you know, I think we, t we touched on why I think that Catalyst will continue to be important. And I think that Catalyst will continue to grow as a gatekeeper and as an important voice in the indie content scene because it has been for 14 years and has discovered a lot of incredible talent. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that uh, I think that as those relationships continue to build and as success stories come out of it, I mean, I, I know that uh, there are almost a dozen people that get signed by a major agency last year. So like it, those opportunities continue to present themselves. And that just means that all of those people know that Catalyst was a big part of, uh, of how they got where they got. Um, and so I'm, I'm excited to see where, where that continues to go. I'm excited to start seeing, uh, some of the alumni programs that I know that you're that you've been talking about. I'm excited about Catalyst Stories and Story Road and and all of the great programs that you've got uh, kind of noodling around in your head of of, of what we're gonna what we're gonna see in the future from from Catalyst. Um, and you know, I think that the advice that I I give to everybody is uh, if you can do anything else at all, do it. And if you can't, then don't wait. Make your show make your thing and if it's not the best version of it don't show people try again and learn your lesson from that first one now you have to show some people to know whether or not it's as good as you think it is but uh um but be uh be honest with yourself and be honest with uh with where you think you're gonna go and that's it you know, I, I remember early one of the early festivals we did an agent panel and we asked well the common question is how do we get discovered how do we get discovered and the answer is you make something incredible 
You make something incredible and you make yourself undeniable. And if you can do those things, then all of the rest of it will be easy. Cool. That's it. That's that easy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just make make the best thing that's ever happened and then you'll be fine. I mean, what, be what more do you need to know? <laughs> cool. Well, thank you for the time and uh, and thanks for getting this started 15 years. Can you believe it's been 15 years? No, I can't actually. I think that that's incredible. Yeah. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, everybody, for, for joining us. Hope this was really informative for you. And uh, we will see you further on down the road. Have a good day. Thank you guys, appreciate it. And, uh, and thank you, Phil, for having me. Really, really appreciate it. Thanks, man. All right. Talk to you soon.